Welcome to This Week in the PNFL. I'm your host, Mark Hill, and along for the ride is Mitch Grawl and Dean Chambers. How you doing this evening, gentlemen? Very good. Yeah, great. Doing great, doing great. So we have another week that is in the books. Uh, things are looking, uh, starting to shuffle around a little bit, I guess, trying to figure out uh, who's going to be doing what and who's going to be, you know, what positions that they're in. Some teams are definitely on that bubble where if they go down one more time, they're pretty much out of it. Uh, would you gentlemen agree? Yeah. It's getting close to that time of season, for sure. Yep. So. Yeah, it's a time where uh, we're going to see teams each week falling out of contention. Yes, I know. I know. Eh, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later on when we go through the uh, projections for this week's games coming up. So. Uh, I'm but, looking at AFC East teams that seem to be on the lower end of that bubble when I look at standings. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah they're on that bubble, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, would you agree with that also, Mitch? Yeah, I think the Jets clinched that division three weeks ago, so I think we're good. Yeah, West has a little bit more um, interesting things going on over there. As long as in the NFC, NFC West is, I think it's pretty much in the same boat as well. So, well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll keep over on the NFC, but Anaheim and Detroit are kind of, uh, maybe not out of it, but they're, um, they need to win more games to be in contention. Yeah. Okay. Kick it up, kick it up a notch. So, all right. So we're going to, before we're going to talk about it a little bit, a little bit later on, but we're going to start this off. Uh, first game on our list is Washington going into San Francisco, and I do not know what happened with Charlie and his Niners, but um, they took a beating by the score of thirty-six to three. We're gonna start this one off with Dean. Oh, I do know what happened. Remember earlier, one of the early weeks in the show. Mitch said that if the 49ers played what he called Ch- Charlie Ball, means running the ball more, they would win. Well, that's exactly what the 49ers did not do. They went with a mostly passing offense. Jerry's Redskins played better Charlie Ball than the 49ers did, and that's why they dominated this game. They ran the ball more. Murray was more efficient at quarterback. This overall much stronger effort by Washington. Okay, would you concur with that, Mitch? It didn't rain. Washington won. That's all you got to know. <laughs> that was straight into the point. Okay. Didn't Even rain. Score, Washington would have even won in the rain. Okay. That was it. Didn't rain. So that was it. Nice take. Next game, we have New York going into Anaheim and the Giants took that game 33 to 9. We're going to start this off with Mitch. All right. Well, you know, um I still believe in the Rams. I still believe they're going to have a say in this playoff race in the NFC, but uh Dobbs had his worst game probably of the year. And, and so uh so goes Dobbs, so goes the Rams. And so might be time to look for a little bit more balance on that offense there for for Anaheim. Uh, but uh, good to see, uh, the, you know, the Giants, you know, come out and, and play a strong game and get themselves back to 500. Okay, Dean. Yeah, this is definitely the stronger effort by the Giants this week. And uh, Dodge threw two interceptions. And Anaheim's offense, again, it's what I call the Beavis and Butthead offense. They didn't score. And going against any team, the Giants or anyone else, even Jacksonville or anyone else, that isn't going to get the job done, the kind of scoring effort that uh, the Rams demonstrated here. I would have never thought you can't, we will come with a Beavis and Butthead reference. <laughs> wow. That, that, that was, that one kind of caught me off guard on that one. <laughs> Next game, Chicago. I'm just thinking, never mind. Uh, Chicago at Green Bay. Here is another road team. Went out uh, 
and took another win. Uh, this one, uh, they won 34 to 24. Mitch. And I tell you, um, you watch this game, and then you look at the stat line, and you go, how did this match up? A 34 to here, Here's the thing. Green Bay, eight first downs. Green Bay, 19 minutes of offense. Green Bay, 127 yards of offense. Yet at one point, they actually took the lead 24 to 17 or 24 20. I can't remember which it was. Um, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, but uh, Chicago, the better team, definitely won out at the end. So congratulations to the Cardinals. Dean. Yeah, the difference here was uh, Chicago scored a, a touchdown and a field goal more, 10 points. Now, I tried to figure out what the mystery was because Chicago dominated statistically almost 500 yards of offense, almost 41 minutes time possession, 63% third down completions, and they only win by two touchdowns. And, you know, what was what was the difference here? Now, the one thing... Green Bay had a kickoff return for 92 yards. When you return a kick for 92 yards, that's almost as good as a score right there. You only need to run the ball or move the ball eight more yards to score. So I think that accounts for some of that. In other words, what's not reflected in the offensive stats for Green Bay is there in the special teams partially. Okay. To your point, they average 40 yards per kickoff return. Yeah, that's a lot. A ninety-two yard kickoff return is basically a score right there, just about. Pretty much, just about. So, all right. Next game on our list, we have New York playing New England, and um, closer. I think it was much closer than some people thought. Uh, the Jets woke up and they took this game twenty to thirteen. Dean. Yeah, New England kept it close. They played the Jets very tough. I noticed that both teams punted five times, and the difference ended up being just a touchdown, much closer than than expected. And I believe that meant that although they just won, they did not cover the spread. No, they did not. Dean. I mean, Mitch, duh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at notes. I'm looking at notes here. Yeah, I played both of these teams recently, and uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that it was a close game. Uh, I, I think uh, both teams are uh, obviously the Jets are, are always uh, a power, but New England uh, has definitely are, are improved. the record isn't showing it, and I know Mox would would agree with that. But I, I would say New England has been playing much better. Uh, here this season. So, um, anyway, what doesn't surprise? Yeah, they, they stumbled out the gate, but they're uh, starting to pick it up. They've put in a pretty decent product out there on the field. So, uh, you know, it wasn't the win that they wanted, but um, they're definitely um, improving. So, that's a good thing. Next game, we have Denver, uh, the headless horseman no more, and take on Jacksonville and the new coach, has his first victory under his belt, winning this game 38-23. to Mitch. Well, you know, usually a team, you know, throws three interceptions, and that usually spells defeat, but not Denver. Uh, Denver uh, still wins by a 15 uh, with three interceptions. And so congratulations to Coach Santos for victory number one, and uh, I'm sure will be one of of many more uh, to come. So uh, congratulations on the first one. Okay, Dean. Well, other than the three interceptions, it was a very solid performance by the Denver offense. They converted 75% of the third downs. They ran the ball 207 yards, 6.9 yards per carry. They only punted once. I guess they turned the ball over three times, then you're not punting those. But nonetheless, other than turnovers, it was very solid performance and that's why they still came out ahead. If it hadn't been for the turnovers, the score probably would have reflected their dominance more than it does. Yep, I agree. I agree on that one. Uh, next game that we have is New Orleans 
taking on Los Angeles. And that one was uh, somewhat of a low-scoring game. And New Orleans ended up taking this one 13-3. We're going to start with Dean on this one. It was somewhat a defensive battle, but, you know, I can't even say that for the Chargers that they had a Beavis and Butthead offense. They had an offense that didn't show up for the most part. And the Saints won. They had more passing, more rushing, and more time of possession. So that ended up being the difference. Okay, Mitch. Yeah, you're not you're not going to win many games. But see, here here's a great example: three interceptions by uh, by uh, Lamar Jackson of Los Angeles, and uh, you know they didn't do anything. Uh, un, you know, unlike uh, Trubisky uh, with uh, with Denver, but uh, the the New Orleans defense absolutely um, smothered Los Angeles, and they kept the ball, um, you know, eighty plays, and so great formula. They don't have to score a lot if you don't let the other team score. So um, nice job there to Coach Perez. Did the Chargers only run the ball five or six times? Uh, yes, I believe that. You have only eight, ran it. Yep. And this was my lead pipe block of the week last week. So uh, I was very happy to see Coach Perez with that one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, next game that we're coming up to um, – one team that definitely, actually two teams that definitely needed to win was Seattle and Indianapolis. And um, I would say that there was a lot of offensive scoring and not really much on the defensive side. Um, and Seattle happened to win this one and get off the schneid uh, by taking this one 31 to 28. We're going to start with Dean on this one. Yeah, I would agree with what you said. It was a fairly close game, ultimately won by the margin of a field goal by the Seahawks. Very important win for Seattle, too. I mean, absolute must that uh, that your team win that game. And, oh. uh, you know, your, your team got it done. So. Yep, Mitch. And Kyle Allen is so good. I mean, Seattle made Kyle Allen look so good that he got player of the game and his team didn't even win. That's how good Kyle Allen is. Man, who spotted that talent out there in the midst of all that uh, all that rough out there? But it, in all seriousness, uh, I was happy to see uh, Seattle because I was tired of having to hear Mark cry for five weeks in a row after losing. After losing five <laughs> games in a row. So, uh, oh, my God. But, uh, you know, I think Indianapolis is still, uh, you know, they're still growing, and I think they're going to be uh, a force to come in, in, in future seasons. How is your head going to get through the doors at your house now? <laughs> uh, they're going to have to widen the doors at your house, man. <laughs> Next game on the list, uh, we have Atlanta – Going uh, hosting Detroit and Atlanta taking this one 21 to 20. We are going to start with Mitch on this and then have the coach fin coach of Atlanta finish it up. So go ahead and start it off, Mitch. Ah, well, I'll tell you what. If anyone was watching this game, you might have missed who won because you might have fell asleep after the first three quarters because it was, whoo, it was a snoozer for about three quarters and then. All heck broke loose, and it was a nutty fourth quarter. Um, so much so that uh, you know it came down to basically a a a, a stone wall stop on the two point conversion uh, to keep Detroit from winning the game. And so, congratulations again, Deed, for another win. Uh, you know, you somehow keep finding a way to squeak them out, but uh, you know, we'll uh, I'll turn it over to you to see what you think. Yeah, most of the scoring was in the fourth quarter. It was very low scoring before that. Now Detroit had made a a decision in 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 their uh, profile that they were going to go for two points pretty much every time they scored a touchdown and. You know, you can argue that, you know, statistically it probably is in their favor. You know, James was saying that 
he makes about 60 percent of his two-point conversions but you know that's one of those things you you know you live by that and you die by it as well and you know the the key two-point conversion was the one that um that didn't uh the other thing about this game, there were two key interceptions, one by each team, <clears throat> that each of them likely took a score off the board. Um, Detroit threw an interception in the end zone, and Justin Fields threw an interception that was intercepted like within the 10 to 15-yard line when it looked like my offense was going to definitely score there. So that's part of why the score was as low as it was after three quarters because – each side lost a likely touchdown in those interceptions. Yep, I, I believe so too. I mean, yeah, and I gotta agree with you, Mitch. It was uh, kind of, kind of, less kind of was a slow, slow roller, but yeah, then it kicked I, up. I, I recommend the folks have not watched this game just to fast forward to the fourth quarter, and that's where all the action. That's where all the action is. <laughs> All right, so as we come up to our last game is a division rival game, and this one was Minnesota hosting Oakland, and Oakland ended up taking that one 31 to 24. We're going to start with you on this one, Dean. Yeah, this is another one <clears> that <throat> was a real mystery when I look at the stats. Oakland dominated in, in every measure of the stats in rushing and passing time and possession. They punted fewer times. They punted three times. Minnesota punted five. An astounding 69% of third down. So why was the game so close? And I think the only real difference, Megan, Mayfield threw an interception, which I don't remember, but I think Minnesota took advantage of that. I mean, the yards of offense were 444 versus 197. So... I can't even really criticize the Oakland defense. I think they generally played fairly well, but, you know, Minnesota did manage to score 24 points. Sometimes you can dominate and still not necessarily reflect it on the scoreboard. Agreed. So, Coach, Oakland's coach, Mitch, what yeah. happened? What, what went on in your game? No, well, you know, I was very pleased, you know, overall with the, with the execution that, as Dean pointed out, there there was um, some turnovers that led to some short fields for for Minnesota that um, obviously uh, made made the impact on 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 the final score. But you know, whenever you play Minnesota, um, you 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 got to be ready for just uh, an all out you know you know brass knuckle brawl and. Um, it uh, you know, they, they, I don't know. Whenever I play Minnesota and Barney, it's it's always it, it kind of reminds me when I play uh, Jerry and the Redskins. You know, it you throw throw the records out the window. It's going to be a bare knuckles brawl, some way or the other. So I was just glad to get the win. Okay, that is yeah, because you got to keep moving as a division rival. So those are the games that you have to win. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So you got to do what you got to do and keep it moving. All right, people. So we have come to the conclusion of that first section. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I know you guys usually do from the comments we've been getting. That's a good thing. Uh, moving into the second segment. This is something that we kind of, you know, normally during pre-show, um, for those that, um, you know, want to know or you know, inquire, uh, we normally kick around a couple of ideas as far as we're going to discuss in the show. And uh, the topic we came up with today is, uh, what would you guys say is more questions of information for the new coaches. And um, leading into this, since out of the three of us, I have the least tenure in the PNFL. And there have been some missteps or things that I've done that, um, by accident and kind of questioned um, some of the coaches. I think Mitch has been a great wealth of information and started communicating with uh, with Dean and then talked to Charlie on a couple of things as well and Richard. Um, so for the new coaches out there, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to come up with uh, some things to discuss uh, from 
the rookie guy over here, and then the mid-level season, mid-level guy, and then the season guy. So kind of got a couple of good ideas here you want to kick around. So uh, we're going to kick it off with me since I have the, the youngest, um, the shortest tenure in the league. So one of the things that I that I dealt with when I came into the league was uh, for my previous uh, previous FB Pro was, um, you know, leagues and playing was trying to figure out the plays when I'm scouting teams or going over the game logs. And at the time, one of the programs I used was the W log stats. Um, that was pretty much the first several seasons, actually up until this season. Um, that was pretty much the program that I used. And while it's good, um, as I was told um, by some coaches, that there's better programs that's still out there and they are still out there. Uh, to kind of give me a little bit more insight. So now I'm using uh, the log stats program and the logger program. Or WS, uh, yeah, I think it's WS stats or WS logger. And um, just a regular logger program to kind of look at the plays, scouting the teams, and now starting to use the logger program to set up um, what I'm looking at from the other team and then use that to run sims. Um, that I found out it's kind of helped me a little bit. Uh, actually, yeah, a bit, even though it's not shown on the field. But um, the beatings could have been much, much worse if I didn't use that type of program. Um, another thing that I was having was some questions with the plays and profiles. And that was one of the issues I had early on and kind of getting a little bit more from, um, understanding of that. So I guess my advice to the new coaches out there is if you know look into these programs reach out to the other coaches try to get some insight from them to see what you can do to make the make your game a little bit more competitive and kind of kick it up a notch i think we agreed um last week's show where we talked about how the standings are pretty much on par where in some years you had one or two teams that was blowing everybody else out and then everyone else is just kind of at the bottom being bottom feeders. Now it's a little bit more competitive. So it's like every week it's, you know, it's a must win game for several, for a lot more teams than it was in the past. So, um, but my advice now is just, you know, reach out to the coaches, look at those different programs that are out there and um, talk with the, if you can't find them, talk to the coaches and see what they can do to try to kind of lead you in that direction to uh, help you out. They're not going to tell you how to win, but they will, point you in the direction of the tools you will need to win. So, um, Dean, do you want to come in on that or comment or take or give us your, your opinion? Yeah, I think you're right about all of that. One of the things that, uh, or, or, or are we going to go to this second and over? Oh, that's right. Me less second and Mitch less. Yeah. The, the other thing I would advise to new team owners, <clears throat> I came from this league, like many having participated in many leagues in the past. The player ratings here in this league are very different. They're much more balanced. They're not as high. They're not as high overall. They're not as, you know, we don't have, like, wide receivers with 99 speed and 38 strength, for example, like some leagues had. So the the ratings are very different. That affects how you make general manager decisions and especially trades. So it's very easy in the other leagues to think that you're willing to sacrifice a point or two and a rating of one player in order to trade for someone who might be like five points higher in speed or something. And when you go into the league, as I did when I first joined with that kind of mentality, it's easy to make what turn out to be bad trades in this league because of the player ratings, that one or two points difference in any given skill rating that you think doesn't make much of a difference makes a lot of difference. There's a big difference between an 82 speed receiver or an 84 speed receiver, or as as we saw in on the forum, you know, I mentioned that there was a defensive end that he signed that had 87 strength. Um, and, again, when you operate the way the old leagues were, if a defensive end was like three points less strength than most of the defensive ends in the league or four points, you think, oh, that's not much difference. Here in this league, that's why an 87 strength defensive end generally doesn't even make a roster when most of our defensive ends are 90, 91, or 92 strength. So I think you have to be very conservative, very careful, you know, really analyze and fully understand the player ratings before you start making trades 
And also realize as a new owner, the sharks are going to circle and they're going to send you lots of schlock trade offers and be ready for that. And don't hesitate to just flat out reject a trade if you don't think it's in the interest of your team. Or, you know, feel free to make a counteroffer if you think someone sent you a trade offer that's ridiculous. That's the biggest thing I can advise new team owners, specifically as it regards to GM role and not end up having your team get dismantled by making mad, bad trades. Okay, good advice. Um, Mitch, you want to take us home with this one? Yeah, you know, I think back when I got uh, back into this league, um, it's been about 10 or 11 seasons uh, ago. And, you know, one of the things that helped me out probably about, I don't know, a couple of seasons or so in was really taking a deep dive into what the, what I, you know, look at the more successful coaches were doing uh, from a game planning standpoint and, and using what you'd already mentioned earlier, uh, Mark, that logger program and loading in past uh, game logs for, you know, the top coaches out there. We, and y'all can go and see, look at the history record, see who those are, Chicago, New York, Washington. Um, back when I got in the, the league, uh, uh, there were some other uh, longtime coaches out there from San Diego and, and the Giants that were out there. And, and I built like maybe three or four seasons worth of logs to get a sense of what plays were these top teams using, you know, and, you know, what plays were they using? What were their profile tendencies, not just from previous weeks for game planning, but over long-term period of time, kind of what, what were they doing? You know, that that maybe I needed to mimic copy or maybe look to incorporate into uh, my, my game plans, both offensively uh, and defensively, because, you know, as Steve talked about, the ratings amongst the players, yes, there are differences. I know Jerry's listening to this and going, but hey, one point makes a difference. And I, yes, I agree, it can. It can make a difference. But there is not that much differentiation between player ratings. So you know, really, the, this league, the separation of the teams is the game planning and the PPP creation from, from, from week to week uh, out there. So getting a sense of what are the – plays that the top coaches are are leveraging you know frequently maybe not every single game or every single week but ones that you know that seem like they lean on quite a bit uh and and look at using those in your plans or you know com- you know maybe uh when you're uh, preparing for a team maybe you look at some of those plays and practice against what the other team is doing some of what mark was mentioning before um i've got a whole preparation process that's probably too lengthy to uh, share here on, on this segment, but um, um, that that would be my thing. Look and see what these other teams are, are doing, not just from a stat standpoint, but from a PPP standpoint uh, over over a period of time, and that'll help you get a sense of what what works and what doesn't in the league. So that, that's what I would that's what I'll share, uh, Mark. Okay, uh, good advice right there, and, and as I said before. Um, you know, reach out to the coaches if you have any questions. They're not going to give you, they're not going to give you all their, you know, secret sauce information. But I think a lot, of, you know, the majority of the coaches will kind of steer you in the right direction and just say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Or kind of look at it this way. And uh, you know, I've had a couple of coaches that I mentioned early on. They were great and helped me out with this and um, kind of making some uh, some headway within the league and at least being a lot more competitive. So. Uh, you know, it's a good thing. All right. So as we wrap that up, we're coming down to our final segment over here. And as we're going into it, we are looking at the week 11 games. And uh, I see there's some pretty good ones out there. And I definitely see a lot of must win games out there. So uh, as we go through this, we'll talk about it and we'll uh, talk about the ones that are must wins. And I think. There might be a couple lead pipe locks in there, too, so we will go through that. So, first game on the list, we have the Redskins going in to play the Rams, and the Rams, um, the spread is um, 
for the Redskins at 10 and a half points. We are going to start this one off with Mitch. All right. Well, I don't think the Anaheim Ray, I don't think they're playing in SoFi Stadium. So rain is possible in this game, but highly unlikely. Uh, I'm going to take Redskins here, but I'm going to say the Rams keep it under that 10 and a half mark. Okay, Dean. I agree about the weather. It's going to be very good weather in Anaheim. But the Redskins are going to dominate this game, both in passing and rushing, and they're, they're going to win this game. This is my lead pipe lock of the week. They're going to win and cover the spread. Yes, Jerry's Redskins are going to cover that 10.5 spread in oh. winning this game. Okay, there's our first lead pipe in there. Okay. Next one, we have the Falcons going to play the Jaguars, and the Falcons have a seven and a half point spread. We're going to go back to Mitch again, and then we're going to come back with the coach. So we're going to start with you on this one again, Mitch. Jaguars are just struggling in all phases of the game right now. I don't see that changing this week. I think Falcons uh, win, and I think they'll actually um, you know, make it uh, look good this week. Okay, Dean. Yeah, I'm going to be optimistic, and uh, I I can't say complete confidence given the way my offense has been very inconsistent. Defense has been a bit better lately, but I think uh, I think this should be a pretty decent win. I mean, you know, we've seen upsets, and I'm hoping this won't be one of them. Okay, next one. We have the Giants going in Detroit to play the Lions, and they're giving the Giants six and a half. Dean, we're going to start with you. Yeah, I think this is going to be a very close game. I think that six and a half spread might be a little too large. So I can see a close game either way, but it is being played at Detroit. Um. This could even be an overtime game. We could even see a score, a, 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 a tie. But Ooh. if it goes in overtime, probably the Giants by a field goal. I think Giants more likely to win, but not cover the spread. Okay, Mitch. Yeah, you know the Giants. They're seventeen and eight in their last uh, twenty-five games in domes uh, in the Central Time Zone. So I am going to go with the Giants, but um, I'm going to say that the Lions uh, keep it under the six and a half. Okay. Um, let's see. Next one that we have, Saints going in to play the Packers. They are giving the Saints four and a half. Mitch, we're starting with you. Saints win. Uh, I think the, the Saints win and they cover. Uh, I'm believing in that uh, Coach Perez defense right now, and, and the, the Packers are you know, a little all over the place right now. So um, I'm going with Saints. Okay. Dean. Uh, this is where the upset bug strikes. The Green Bay Packers are going to get get things back together, and we're going to see the very strong Green Bay team this week. Green Bay wins at home. Okay. Next game. This one is a pick 'em. It is the Vikings going up against the 49ers. I'm going to sneak in here and I'm going to give my lead pipe lock to the 49ers this week. So, we'll get with that little sneak in there. That's the second one. We're going to start with you, Dean. Yeah, um, Charlie rediscovers playing Charlie Ball here, and, and that includes running the ball a lot more effectively. San Francisco wins at home. Okay, Mitch. This is my lead pipe, uh, lead pipe, lead pipe game uh, of the week, and I look at this and I go, you know what? I just played this Vikings team, and I absolutely, you know, outgained them and outplayed them on the stat sheet. But you know what? It was still a tough game, and I still. Uh, my lead pipe lock of the week here is Vikings to go into San Francisco and, and beat the uh, San Francisco 49ers. Vikings, AFC West, all done. And hey, we have lead pipe lost on both sides of this game. So Interesting. Right. No jinx here. 
No jinx. No jinx. <laughs> Next one, we have the Cardinals hosting the Raiders, and they are giving the Cardinals seven and a half. We are going to start with you, Dean. All right, this is seven a seven point five, seven and a half point spread. It looks a little large, and even with the backup quarterback playing in Chicago, I think um, it's. I think the key matchup is Oakland's defense versus Chicago's offense. But in the end, I think the the speed of those wide receivers and their ability to get open. I think this is a uh, a Chicago win covering the spread. Okay. Mitch, what's, what's your team going to do? I mean, it's obvious that we don't even need to show up this week. We're seven and a half point underdogs to a team that just lost their all world quarterback. We're playing on the road. It's probably going to snow. We're from, you know, California. I don't even know how we're playing this game, Mark. I just think we just, just go on to this the Seattle Jets game. I, I don't even know why we haven't been talking about this. <laughs> okay. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'm sure you're going to put in a solid effort and give uh, give Chicago a game. And, you know, you could still lose by eight points and play them very tough. I, I, I don't even know if I'm going to show up, Dean. I don't even know if I'll send them PPP. Should, should we give the Raiders a lead pipe lock? Yeah, no, I'm not buying that bill of goods. You're going to show up, obviously. Oh, yeah, we know that. We know that. He's not fooling anybody out there. So, Next game, we have the Seahawks in a definite must win. Tall mountain to climb, going up against the Jets. Nine and a half points. Mitch. Um, I think you keep it under that nine and a half, Mark. I do. I think Seattle keeps under nine and a half. Um, Jets are always tough. I know they've been a little shaky lately. Um, they're still the Jets. So I'm going to say Jets, but I'm going to say that uh, you keep it under that nine and a half. Okay. Dean. On paper, it should say that the Jets would win. I'm not sure whether they're actually going to win by 10 points, which is what they'd have to do to cover the spread. But. Something tells me that uh, we could see an upset here. That would be nice. <laughs> we definitely need it. Next game, Chargers and the Colts. Uh, Colts are hosting the Chargers. I don't think that this Colts team is going to be like the Colts in the NFL when they played Dallas last night. We're not going to talk about that. But they are giving the Chargers seven and a half. So we're going to start with you on this one, Dean. I think uh, I'm not sure what's going on with the Chargers. I think uh, Indianapolis wins this game at home. Okay. Mitch. Can we go back to the Sunday night game and really question why do we have a, an eight and four team playing a four and seven team on Sunday night football, please? Anyway, I digress. I digress. Um, I'm I'm leaving with you there, Dean. I, I think uh, I think Kyle Allen. I you know you know that's my favorite quarterback behind Baker Mayfield in the PNFL. So uh, I'm going to ride with Allen here and uh, say the Colts get the win. Okay, last game for this week is the Broncos going into New England to take on the Patriots, and they are giving the Broncos seven and a half. Uh, we're going to let you finish this one up, Mitch. Hey, Broncos win, Patriots keep it under seven and a half. Okay, quick and to the point, Dean. Yeah. Uh, the, the the Denver offense is just just too effective. They're not only going to win, they will cover the spread. Wow. Okay. There you have it, gentlemen. Uh, we have the full wrap-up for this week. Um, I thank you very much for tuning in and listening along with the coaches. So any, fa any last words that you have for this week's games coming up, Dean? I think the games are going to be very interesting and very important games for some teams that need these wins to stay in contention for postseason. Yes, I would agree. Uh, Mitch, any final words before you take us home? 
I got two final words, Mark. Yes. No, I don't. I've got three final words. <laughs> 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 I just did my Joe Biden impression. I got three words for us, Mark. Uh, let's get it. Ha, 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 ha.